everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today I want to talk about different kinds of bacterial oxygen preferences. Really, in the broadest sense, bacteria can be classified into two different categories based on whether or not they require oxygen. There are aerobes, or aerobic bacteria, that require oxygen for growth, and then there are anaerobes, or anaerobic bacteria, that do not require oxygen for growth. On the board, I've drawn five test tubes. I want to point out that these test tubes are filled with a culture media. So this is just medium that allows bacteria to grow. It contains various nutrients. Where the media meets the air, there's a high concentration of oxygen. And then at the bottom of the test tube, there's a very low concentration of oxygen. Here I'm using O2 as the molecular symbol for oxygen. If we look more in depth at different types of oxygen requirements for bacteria, we see that they fall into five different categories. First, we'll talk about obligate aerobes. Obligate aerobes are bacteria that require oxygen. They need oxygen in order to generate energy for the cell, in order for it to be healthy and to grow and to replicate. So obligate aerobes are going to grow only in the top portion of the culture media, where it meets the air, where we have a high concentration of oxygen. An example of an obligate aerobe would be Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Of course, this makes sense. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bacteria that causes tuberculosis in our lungs. And what do we have a lot of in our lungs? Oxygen, because that's what we breathe. So that's an example of an obligate aerobe. Next, we have facultative anaerobes. Facultative anaerobes are considered anaerobes because they don't require oxygen. They can survive without it. But if they use oxygen, they can generate more energy more efficiently and grow better. That's why with facultative anaerobes, they are mostly clustered up at the edge of the culture medium where there's a high concentration of oxygen. But we see that some of the bacteria are also growing lower down in the tube where there's a lower oxygen concentration because they can survive in these conditions. E. coli is an example of a facultative anaerobe. If we keep moving on, now we get to the obligate anaerobes. As you might expect from their name, they are anaerobes because they don't require oxygen, and in fact, oxygen is toxic to these kinds of bacteria. That's why in the test tube, we see that these oxygen, these um, bacteria are only growing in the portion of the test tube where there is no oxygen present. An example of an obligate anaerobe would be different kinds of Clostridium species. So for example, Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism and Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus. This makes sense as well, because if you think about when people get botulism, it's often from ingesting food that was not prepared properly, that's been sealed, so it's been in a can where they're not able to grow, and then once you eat them, they enter into this oxygen-depleted condition where they're able to germinate and begin to grow. Um, it's the same thing with tetanus, like if you get stabbed by a rusty nail, those bacteria are able to penetrate so deeply into your skin, they get into parts of the tissue that don't have much oxygen, and that's where those obligate anaerobes are able to grow. Next, we have a class of bacteria called aerotolerant anaerobes.
These are bacteria which, by their name, anaerobes, you can see that they don't require oxygen. But they aren't really harmed by it either. That's why in the culture medium, in this test tube, they grow throughout. They're able to grow at the top, in the middle, and at the bottom. And they do so evenly, because while they don't actually use the oxygen, it's not toxic to them either. An example of an aerotolerant anaerobe are species of lactobacillus. These are bacteria that live in the human vagina and also in the gastrointestinal tract. Our final class of bacteria are called microaerophiles. Microaerophiles are interesting because they require oxygen, but they require it at a concentration that is less than atmospheric level. That means that the oxygen that is here in the air at the top of the test tube and that's in the very top portion of the medium is too much oxygen for them to be able to survive. But they do require some oxygen, which is why they grow in this narrow band in the middle of the test tube. An example of a microaerophile is Camp Campylobacter digenii, which is, uh, it can be an opportunistic human pathogen. Um, and it can be the cause of some foodborne illnesses. So those are the examples of five different classes of bacteria classified based on their oxygen preferences. So we just finished talking about those five different classes of bacteria in the ways that they require or don't require oxygen. We talked about how to some of those classes of bacteria, oxygen is toxic. Right now, I want to talk about why that is. Now, most organisms, including humans, when our cells go through a process called cellular respiration, this is what the cells use in order to generate energy, they have a byproduct called a superoxide-free radical. Superoxide-free radicals are very, very reactive because they have this extra electron. Because they'll react with so many things, they can really disrupt a lot of cellular processes. This makes them toxic. Many organisms, including humans and most bacteria, have enzymes to help deal with these free radicals. One enzyme is called superoxide dismutase. You'll also hear it referred to as SOD, S-O-D. So superoxide dismutase changes superoxide free radicals into hydrogen peroxide. This means you go from having superoxide free radicals, which are very toxic, to having hydrogen peroxide, which is still toxic, but less so. And then humans and many types of bacteria have additional enzymes. These are called catalase and peroxidase. These further break down hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So these are not toxic. And with those five different classes of bacteria, you have some, like these striped aerobes, that require oxygen and tolerate oxygen very well. They have these enzymes. They're able to take these superoxide free radicals that are produced when they're making energy and then convert them down to products that are not toxic. Other types of bacteria, for example, these strict anaerobes, they don't have these enzymes. So strict anaerobes, when they're in the presence of oxygen, they're building up these superoxide free radicals, which are very dangerous and harm the cell and kill the cell. 
Then you have other kinds of bacteria, for example, the aerotolerant anaerobes, where they have sod, they have this one enzyme, so they can at least convert the superoxide free radicals into a less toxic form, but then they lack these additional enzymes that convert hydrogen peroxide down to the non-toxic water and oxygen. So this is why some types of bacteria can survive in oxygen and other types of bacteria can't.